Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. It is the truth. We receive it written in our heart and mind. Thank you for the revelation of it. We will be hearers and doers of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We are sharing with you a series of messages on the subject of the Holy Spirit. We began talking about the true doctrine of the Holy Spirit, pointing out the difference between the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the receiving of the Holy Spirit, and the filling of the Holy Spirit, extremely important to understand of the working of the Holy Spirit. And then we talked about understanding the Feast of Pentecost and what happened at that point and what God has purposed and what he's accomplishing through the church age as we understood the Feast of Pentecost. And then we began talking about the working of the Holy Spirit. We talked about how the Holy Spirit works in the Old Testament. And today we're going to continue on talking about how the Holy Spirit works in the New Testament today. We begin in Matthew 3.11. I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. We pointed out to you that this is the first experience that comes to a person's life when they are baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire. Notice by there that the with there is italicized. Not talking about two different things. It's talking about one occurrence that happens at once. The baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire occur at one point. And that is when a person gets born again and the old spirit is burned up and eliminated, which is what the fire does. We saw this from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, clearly telling us what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. Unfortunately, full gospel, Pentecostal, charismatic people have not understood the truth regarding what this is. They have thought that it is a secondary experience after you're born again, erroneously, which is false. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. The baptism of the Holy Spirit brought us into the body of Christ. That's what happens when we get born again. Baptism means to immerse or submerge or engulf in something. We are in the presence of the Holy Spirit. He takes the old spirit out. A new spirit comes in, which is the spirit of Jesus Christ that we get when we are born again. And then we talked about the second experience. And we'll look at a couple scriptures on that. And that is the receiving of the Holy Spirit, which is different. The receiving of the Holy Spirit is after a person is born again, and that's how the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in you. One of the clearest scriptures is in Acts chapter 8, verse 5. Philip went down the city of Samaria, preached Christ unto them. The people with one accord gave heed to the things that Philip spake. So they received the word about Jesus Christ to get born again. We come to verse 12. When they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So they got born again as they called on the name of the Lord, and they, now they got baptized with water. What had happened to them? They got a new spirit. What spirit? The spirit of Jesus Christ. Did they get the Holy Spirit yet? No. How do we know? Now we read on to verse 14. When the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Receive is the word lambano, which means to take into you, to take hold of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them. They hadn't received the Holy Spirit yet. Only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They laid their hands on them and they receive the Holy Spirit. The receiving of the Holy Spirit is the second experience whereby the Holy Spirit comes to dwell on the inside of us. The third experience we talked about is the filling of the Holy Spirit. We pointed out that that occurred in the Old Testament era, and it also occurs in the New Testament era. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, the new birth, is a one-time event. You get born again, you get the new spirit of Jesus Christ. It happens one time. Then you receive the Holy Spirit. That's a one-time event where the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in you. The filling of the Holy Spirit is not a one-time event. Ephesians chapter 1, chapter 5, verse 18. Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. When we put the cursor over the word filled, 
and we look below when I bring up the tense, voice, and mood, we see that the tense is a present tense. The present tense means continuous, repeated, ongoing action. Continuous, repeated, ongoing action. So, that means we're to literally be continuously being filled with the Spirit. That means it's not a one-time thing. It's supposed to happen day after day after day in your life. And how's it going to happen? Here's one of the ways. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Otherwise, as you're praising and worshiping God, it's going to bring a filling of the Spirit. Notice it has a dual effect. You're ministering to the Lord, but you're also speaking to yourselves to release the presence of the Holy Spirit, a filling of the Holy Spirit in you. God wants every one of us to be filled with the Holy Spirit daily as you praise and worship Him. Another scripture that shows this is through prayer, Acts chapter 4, verse 31. Here's where they were having a prayer meeting. When they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. These guys were already born again and had the Holy Spirit. They were having a prayer meeting. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. And what does the filling do? It enables you to serve the Lord effectively because it's the influence of the Holy Spirit for the service of the Lord. They spake the word of God with boldness. And it talks about in verse 33, with great power, the apostles gave witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them. And they did miraculous works and saw people come to the Lord. So we talked about this last Sunday, but we also wanted to reiterate this. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is the new birth. When we receive Jesus as personal Lord and Savior, we get the Spirit of His Son, the Spirit of Jesus Christ. The receiving of the Holy Spirit is where the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in us, and you should call it the receiving of the Holy Spirit. That's where the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in us after we're born again. And then the filling of the Holy Spirit ongoing to occur in your life through praise, worship, and prayer on a continual basis. As we continue to look at the, wor leading, that the working of the Holy Spirit, we must understand the Holy Spirit's come to dwell in you to do a lot of things. Now, we're going to be talking about how He works in the New Testament. First of all, we see that He will lead you. In Matthew chapter 4, 1, Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness. Now, in this case, He was led there because He was going to go through the testings that Adam had failed. He was going to walk the walk that Adam had failed. And he was tempted of the devil. Well, you and I are walking through a spiritual wilderness in respect of being tested to see if we're going to walk in the ways of the Lord as we're going to possess the promises, the promise of God, which is our spiritual promised land. So the Holy Spirit will be leading you and guiding you. The devil will be coming at you to try to take the word out of your heart and try to hinder you from walking in the ways of the Lord. But as you are being led by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will be working through the Word that He brings into you, that you will walk in the Word and you will conquer all of the temptations. Jesus conquered them all, and He wants you to do the very same thing. In fact, in Luke's account, after He had returned, He was full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan, led the Spirit in the wilderness, and after He'd gone through and conquered the temptations with the Word of God, we see in verse 14, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit unto Galilee. You will operate in the Word of God. You will speak the Word to conquer the temptations. And the power of God is what you live by. And you're going to function according to the power of the Spirit. He returned in the power of the Spirit. He wasn't all beat down. He was full of the power. You're to be the same way. As you walk in line with the Word and you do what the Word says, you will conquer the temptations and you will also walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus then began to go forth in his ministry. And we see in verse 18, he's declared, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, the year of Jubilee, when everybody goes free from all bondages and are brought to liberty. Well, the same thing is upon you and me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon us to go and preach the gospel, and we're to do the very same works, to bring healing, to bring deliverance, to see people be set free from all bondages in life. The anointing of God is upon you, and He wants you to go forth and preach the gospel. 
The Holy Spirit also, we see in the New Testament, was continually working. Even in, before the day of Pentecost, we see in Luke chapter 2, verse 25. Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. The same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. The Holy Spirit was upon him, leading him and ca causing him to wait for what was coming, which was Jesus. It was revealed to him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. The Holy Spirit, who is going to be leading you and guiding you and directing you, he will reveal things to you. As he was upon him and manifested himself, he revealed things to him. The Holy Spirit has come to do many things, and one of the things, he wants to reveal things to you. And he was revealing to him the fact that he would not see death till he'd seen the Lord's Christ. He came by the Spirit. He's led by the Spirit. God wants you to be led by the Spirit step by step, day by day, in all that you do. He came by the Spirit into the temple, and when his parents brought him the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, from thine eyes have seen thy salvation, which was prepared before the face of all people. He saw what God told him was going to come to pass. The Holy Spirit will lead you, he will guide you, he will speak to you, he will reveal things to you, and he will show you things and lead you exactly on time. He was right on time there at the temple when this happened. We also see in Matthew chapter 10 the working of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament and how He will work in your life. Verse 20. This is where it's talking about people come and talks about them being delivered up uh, by people that were taking them and, and the evil people, which was talking about end times, governors and kings will take you up, deliver you up. Um, and imprison you in some cases, as that happened here. And it says, For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. When anybody comes and whatever they try to do to you, the Holy Spirit will be ready to speak through you. Remember, it's not you that's doing the speaking. It's the Spirit of your Father, the Holy Spirit, which speaks in you, that's going to have you give you what to speak in a situation. You need to be getting the Word in you, and letting the Holy Spirit quicken the Word and show you what He wants to speak through you. Otherwise, we don't do it in the flesh. The Holy Spirit's going to bring things to you. He's going to bring things up to your mind. And then He's going to relay what the Father says, and you're going to speak by the Spirit of the Father. That is the Holy Spirit. Also, as you go forth, you're going to do the mighty works of God. And as we pointed out, the Holy Spirit is a performer of the Word and you will do works by means of the Holy Spirit who performs the word as you're acting upon it. Matthew 12, 28, Jesus said, If I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, he was doing it by the Spirit of God, who is the performer of the word, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. In the New Testament, we've been given authority. We have authority over all the power of the enemy. We speak in the name of Jesus, Jesus is involved in seeing these works be done. And when we do this, the Holy Spirit is going to be the performing these things and accomplishing these. Here it said, he cast out devils by the Spirit of God. Another thing we must realize is that you never want to speak against anything that the Holy Spirit has done. Matthew 12, 31 says, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. Whosoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaks against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. Neither in this age, not world means age, or neither in the age to come it's talking about, or in, in that which is to come. World is actually italicized, it's not even there. It's talking about age, neither in this age, or in the one that's coming, showing the fact that you will not be forgiven if you speak against the Holy Spirit. Now, what is the blasphemy in the Holy Spirit? It is where you are attributing the works of the Holy Spirit as to being done by the devil's power. And in the context, that's what happened. Remember what was going on back here. 
he cast the demons out of this man to see him be set free. And the Pharisees were saying that he was casting out the devils by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. He was saying he was doing it by the devil's power instead of the Holy Spirit's power. That is tantamount to blaspheming the Holy Spirit. You do not speak against the Holy Spirit about what he has done and say it was the devil doing it. People that do that are in trouble. Those people that have said that tongues are of the devil are in trouble because tongues is of the Holy Spirit. Now, a lot of people have said that. They've been deceived by the enemy. No, oh, speaking in tongues is of the Holy Spirit. Never speak against anything that is a work of the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 14, we begin to see specifically things that the Holy Spirit will do in your life. John 14, verse 16. He said, I will pray the Father that he will give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Now we need to stop on this verse for a moment. Many people have taken this verse as, from a once saved, always saved stance and saying, see, he's going to abide with us forever. Well, that's not what it says. Number one, it says to the age, not forever. But secondly, when it says he may abide, is that a statement of fact forever or even to the age? No. How do we know? You've got to look up the tense and vo voice and mood of everything. When I put the cursor over the word abide, it shows that this is ongoing action, present tense, but it is in the subjunctive mood. We have pointed out that there are five moods in the Greek. And the subjunctive mood, whenever you see something in the subjunctive mood, is very important. Because the subjunctive mood expresses things that are contrary to fact, conditional upon conditions being met. In other words, it's saying, I will pray the Father, he'll give you another comforter, that he may abide with you to the age continually if you meet the conditions. If you continually meet the conditions, meaning if you don't meet the conditions, uh, he's not going to do that. This is important to understand because many people have not understood the truth, the fact that the Holy Spirit is not guaranteed that he would always abide with you. You have to meet the conditions. But the good news is, if we're walking with the Lord, he will abide with you continually. Verse 17, even the Spirit of truth, that's another name for the Holy Spirit, he's the Spirit of truth, he will bring truth to you and bring reality to you, whom the world cannot receive. Remember the world, those people that are out there in the world that are not born again, they cannot take Lombano, the Holy Spirit, into them. Remember, you, well, you got to get born again and receive the Spirit of Christ first. Then you can receive the Holy Spirit to dwell in you. He goes on and says, Because it seeth them not, neither knoweth them, but you know them, for he dwelleth with you, or this really means besides or near you, because it's the word para, not the word meta, which is the main word for with in the New Testament. We pointed this out before. If we look at uh, uh, the scripture here where it says with, I got the cursor over the word with. This is the word meta in the Greek. And if you notice, 345 times it's translated with. It's the primary word to be translated that. But this is not that word. This is the word para, which really means besides or near when you look it up in the lexicons. So it's speaking, he was dwelling near them or beside them but shall be in you, which is speaking of the New Testament. Now the Holy Spirit has come to dwell on the inside of us. But notice it says, you know him. They even knew him when the Holy Spirit was simply dwelling near them or beside them, because he would reveal himself to them in the Old Testament. But now he's come to dwell on the inside of us. He is in us, and he does so many more things, as you will see. Verse 26 John 14, 26, The Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. That means you are going to be taught all things by the Holy Spirit who brings revelation to you. It means you can be taught everything. Don't think that you can't know all things or be taught all things. The Bible says he shall teach you all things. You can be taught all things if you spend the time in the Word to learn all things. 
What else is he going to do? He's going to bring all things to your remembrance. He will quicken things and bring them up to your mind. You see this happen in your life at times when all of a sudden a scripture comes up to your mind or something that the Holy Spirit will bring to your revelation or bring to your remembrance that he's revealed to you in the past. Suddenly it comes. What's that? That's the Holy Spirit bringing that to you. Or maybe brings a scripture to you at some point or something that you've learned in the past. He'll bring all things to your remembrance, whatever I have said unto you. So the Holy Spirit will teach you, but he also will bring things to your mind. We go on, and we see over in uh, chapter 15, verse 26. When the Comforters come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me. The Holy Spirit always testifies of the things of Jesus. And Jesus is the Word, so it's always going to be in line with the Word. Anything that is a testimony contrary to the Word or points away from Jesus is not coming from the Holy Spirit. It's coming from a false spirit. We unfortunately have a lot of people that say things that are false, that are not pointing to Jesus Christ. Anybody that speaks anything not testifying of Jesus, it is not the Holy Spirit bringing it forth. John 16. Verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. The reason being is Jesus got the Holy Spirit from the Father. It was the promise of the Father and sent him in on the day of Pentecost, which is the day that he was sent in. Verse 8, when he's come, it tells you what the Holy Spirit will do. And this is what he does to the world, those people that are not born again. He will reprove or convict the world, those people out there in the world, of three things. Of sin, not sins, but sin, singular. Of righteousness and also of judgment. We'll see each one of these. Of sin, singular, because they believe not on me. In other words, the Holy Spirit, in order to bring a person to the place of being born again, he does not convict him of all the sins that you committed in your life, that you have to confess your sins, as so many people teach out there, that you've got to confess your sins and repent of all the sins you've committed in your life before you can be born again. It's a lying, false teaching from the devil. He only convicts you of one sin, the sin of not believing on Jesus, because that's the only thing that hinders you from coming into relationship with the Father. In fact, we'll come back here in a moment. In 2 Corinthians... Chapter 5, verse 19. To wit, or to know, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. Notice the next part. Not imputing or reckoning or charging their trespasses unto them. God's not charging anybody's trespasses unto them. Your sins, what you've committed in the natural, that's not going to stop you from getting born again. What do you need? You need a new spirit. But the answer is, you've got to get a brand new spirit on the inside of you. That's why, what is the sin? The sin that we're convicted of is not believing on Jesus. And the reason is, because when we believe on Jesus and then we receive him, what happens? We get a new spirit. The old spirit's taken out. A new spirit comes in. We come into relationship with him. And that is the first step. Our sins will be dealt with after that in the soul and in the body. But we need a new spirit. That's what brings us into relationship with God. So of sin, because they believe not on me. This is why you preach the gospel of good news. Jesus Christ has paid the price and accomplished the redemption. He's the Savior of the world. He wants you to, you to, receive, he wants you to receive Jesus as personal Lord and Savior and get born again. You don't have to do anything. Just receive Jesus. If you believe the gospel and receive him, you will be born again and come into relationship with the Father. That's what you preach to people. Second thing, of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Meaning he is the righteous one, the one who has been raised from the dead, the one who is alive forevermore, the one who now has been seated at the right hand of the Father, he has now been enthroned, and he is the one who judges according to righteous. He is the righteous one. Verse 11, 
The other thing he's going to convict the world of? Of judgment. The reason about righteousness, of course, is that nobody else is righteous. There's only one that has been righteous, Jesus. And that's the only one that we can receive as our Lord and Savior. Of judgment. Because the prince of this world, it says, is judged. But really, it's not the best translation because this is a perfect tense verb. A perfect tense means action that's been completed in the past with present effects at the time of speaking. It would be better translated, as Young's brings it out, the ruler or prince of this world has been judged. In other words, his judgment has been set. Now, as far as the actual carrying out of it when he's thrown in the lake of fire, that hasn't happened yet. But his judgment has been set. set. <clears throat> Which means anybody who's under Satan's dominion, he, the judgment that's set on Satan is also set on them. That's why a person's got to get born again. Anybody that's not born again, their judgment is set because they're under Satan's dominion until they receive Jesus and be born again. This is why these are the three things that you declare. They need to receive Jesus, Jesus the righteous one, and there's judgment on the one who's the God of this world, the devil, the one who's the spiritual father of mankind, and you've got to receive him or you're going to be judged in, in, in the same judgment that he has. You preach the gospel and how they can come to Jesus and be born again. We come to verse 13, speaking more about what the Holy Spirit's work is. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. We saw that he will teach you all things, and here it says he'll guide you into all truth. So as you are studying the word, you need to have confidence that God will guide you into all truth. I've seen this and been following this verse, as well as all the other verses as well, but especially focusing on this verse as I'm studying the Word, that He will lead me and guide me into all truth on every subject. And see, He does that as you spend time in the Word. He will guide you into all truth. Don't think He won't. Don't believe the lie that we can't know all these things. It's a lie. We can know everything in the Word of God as we spend the time studying it. Notice what else. For He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. That shows you something. He's simply relaying what he hears, and he hears something from above. He's not originating anything. He is relaying what he hears. And notice, he does not speak of himself, meaning the Holy Spirit does not originate things. Anybody that ever speaks something that they say that's of the Holy Spirit that is not in line with the Word of God is a lie. They have come forth something that's not from the Holy Spirit because He only relays the things that He hears from above, which are all in line with the Word of God. He doesn't originate things. Anything that tries to say, oh, the Holy Spirit's come up with some extra uh, beyond the Bible revelation, uh, get away from them quickly. It's a lie. Many people even take extra biblical books and extra biblical things and think it's truly from the Holy Spirit bringing revelation about this being true today. It's a lie. These people are deceived. And there's lots of them out there in the body of Christ. Get away from them. So the Holy Spirit will relay things that are in line with the Word of God and He does not originate anything. It has to be in line with the Word of God. Notice what else. He will show you things to come or the coming things. He'll show you things that are come. He'll give you revelation of things that will happen in the future. The Holy Spirit will do this. Verse 14, He shall glorify me. He will always glorify Jesus. Always pointing towards glorifying Jesus. Anything that, that does not glorify Jesus is not of the Holy Spirit. For he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. So he's going to announce it. He's going to reveal it to you. He's going to bring revelation, make known to you. This word means in some aspect he will show you these things. So we've seen a lot of important things even in these verses. That the Holy Spirit is going to teach you all things. He'll bring all things to your remembrance. And he's going to guide you into all the truth. He will not originate things. He takes the things above and simply relays them unto you. And he'll show you the coming things and always testify of the things of Jesus and glorify him. Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit will manifest 
a prayer language, speaking in tongues, once you have the Holy Spirit in you. Acts chapter 2, verse 4. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The Holy Spirit gives this language. This is praying in tongues. We see about what this is declared over in 1 Corinthians 14. Verse 15 says, What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit. You can pray with your spirit. Remember, the new spirit you get is the spirit of Jesus Christ. When you receive the Holy Spirit, he comes and dwells in your spirit. So you are now can pray with your spirit by means of the Holy Spirit who's dwelling in you. He says also that I will sing with the spirit. Notice there's praying with the spirit and praying with the mind. The word understanding means mind. It's the word noose. So that's according to your known language, what you understand. But praying with the Spirit, what is it? As well as singing with the Spirit, it's in tongues. Verse 14, if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. This is a prayer language that you have. Once you have the Holy Spirit within you, you have this prayer language. And you can pray in tongues at will. It's already there. God wants everybody to pray with their spirit in tongues. You do not know what you're saying. Your understanding or your mind is unfruitful, meaning you don't know what you're saying. Why? Because you are speaking what the Holy Spirit speaks through you. When you are doing this, you are speaking in a language that you don't know. 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. 13, that is. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. These tongues can be other tongues of men that you don't know, or they could be angelic tongues that nobody knows. But these tongues you will not understand. As we see over in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2. He that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men. Notice he doesn't know the tongue. He doesn't understand it. He's speaking spiritual words or syllables that are coming forth from the Holy Spirit, coming out of you, but you don't understand what you're saying. You're speaking not unto men, but unto God, how no man understands him. Howbeit in the Spirit he speaks mysteries, or things that are hidden. This is a means whereby the Holy Spirit can pray through you for things that need to be prayed for, you don't know what you're praying, but he knows. And this is tremendously powerful because how much do we know of the things of God compared to the Holy Spirit? A drop in the bucket. He knows everything. You and I know a little bit. So if you can pray a prayer according to what you know, according to the Word, that's good. We should do that. But how about for the things you don't know what to pray for? Maybe you have some situation and you say, boy, I need to pray for some things regarding this to see some changes or breakthroughs or see this person be one to the Lord or see, see God bring revelation in this area and I don't know what all to pray for. I prayed everything I know. Start praying in tongues. The Holy Spirit will start praying through you for things that you don't even know what all to pray for. So you are speaking things that are hidden in the Spirit that are going to release what the Holy Spirit speaks, and He is simply interceding through you because it's not going to men, it's going up to God the Father. And of course, it's going to get an audience with Him, and it's going to come to pass for the things that you pray. It is tremendously powerful. Also, praying in tongues also works to bring spiritual edification to you and to bring a filling of the Spirit in your life. 1 Corinthians 14, 4. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. He is building up himself. So it's bringing a spiritual edifying or building up. It also brings a filling of the Holy Spirit. This is when you pray in tongues for a period of time. Also, it will even build up your faith. Jude, verse 20. Ye beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. It is a prayer language. God wants every one of us to have our prayer language. If you don't speak in tongues, I invite you to come up at the end of the service 
and we'll help you. If you haven't received the Holy Spirit, come up. We want you to get the Holy Spirit and get your prayer language in operation. He wants everybody to pray in tongues. Now, some people say, well, must I pray in tongues? Yes. In order to be saved? No. Don't let anybody tell you that one. But must you pray in tongues? Yes, according to the Word, because this is what it says. Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities. The word infirmities means weaknesses. You have to look at the context to see whether it's talking about weaknesses of body or weaknesses of mind. In this case, it's talking about weaknesses of mind. How do we know? To read on. For we know not what we should pray for. Otherwise, we don't know in our mind. So it's talking about weaknesses of mind. Do we know everything to pray for? No. But who does? The Holy Spirit. Notice what it says. We do not know what we should know what we should pray for as we ought. This is the key word. The word ought is a word which means as is necessary. It is a word that is translated must the majority of times, 58 of the 106 uses, meaning that we don't know what we should pray for as we must and as necessary. If you look this word up in Strong's, it means necessary as binding. In other words, it is necessary for you to pray for all the things that need to be prayed for. And if you don't know what all to pray for, then how can I pray for what's necessary and what I must? By praying in tongues. That's what goes on. It says, the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. This is, when it says cannot be uttered, this means that, that which is coming forth that's not expressed in words or normal speech. That's what tongues is. It's bringing forth syllables in not normal speech. It might be angelic tongues. So this is talking about praying in tongues. Therefore, we must pray in tongues and pray with our understanding in line with the word if we're going to pray as is necessary as binding and pray effectively for all the things that need to be prayed. So when you pray for something specifically according to the word of God with your mind, then start praying in tongues as well. Pray both of those in order to see the Holy Spirit accomplish the things that need to be prayed for. Many people don't pray in tongues the way they should, which is a mistake. Another thing that we see, the working of the Holy Spirit, is He can work in lots of different ways. And we'll see this more when we get into the book of Acts a little farther down about how Paul functioned. Acts chapter 2, verse 17. It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Young men shall see visions. Old men shall dream dreams. Prophecy, visions, and dreams will come from the Holy Spirit who gives you these things. Not every dream is from the Holy Spirit. It could be just from you, from what you're dreaming because of what you're doing and you're just dreaming about something you were doing. Or it could be from the devil who tries to give you false dreams or tormenting dreams. Demons can work that in people, especially if you've been through a lot of traumatic things in the past. But the Holy Spirit will also bring dreams or visions and also to prophesy. These are all things by the Holy Spirit to bring forth the things that He wants to bring forth. One of the things that's important is getting filled up with the Holy Spirit for the influence of the Holy Spirit in our life. Here we see in Acts chapter 4, this is after the man had gotten healed at the gate beautiful, and they brought, they were interrogating him, the, the religious leaders were interrogating him uh, before the high priest and Caiaphas and all these ones. They were gathered together, and they set, set them, Peter and John, in the midst, and they said, by what power, by what name have you done this? And Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost. Is everybody filled with the Holy Spirit just because you're born again and you have the Holy Spirit? No. If you haven't been praising and worshiping God, if you haven't been praying in tongues and doing what's necessary to bring the filling of the Holy Spirit, then it's not necessarily so. But Peter, obviously, was filled with the Holy Spirit. And he said to them, and he began to preach and declare the Word of God to them, the truth to them. The filling of the Holy Spirit will influence you to carry out the service of the Lord. And he began to speak forth the truth to them by the anointing of the Holy Spirit, speaking forth truth. 
And this truth it went forth to them. And as they spoke, he told, declared all these things. And of course, they saw the boldness of Peter and John, perceived they were unlearned and ignorant men. They marveled and took knowledge of them that they'd been with Jesus. They said, how do these guys know all this stuff? Well, these guys, and how, where'd they get this boldness? Well, that was from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will bring a boldness upon you, and you will speak by the Holy Spirit's influence as you are speaking things. And these, he was speaking forth, and it marveled them. They it really got to them. And also, we already saw this scripture once before, but we'll look at it again for a moment. Acts 4.31, When they prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and spake the word of God with boldness. Boldness again. The filling of the Holy Spirit will bring a spiritual boldness upon you. And as we pointed out, with great power, they gave witness to the resurrection and great grace was upon them. When the Holy Spirit gets involved, the power of God will get involved. And the favor of God will get involved. Great grace was upon them as they began to speak the things of God. God wants you to get full of the Holy Spirit. We come down to Acts chapter 3. This is the case where, as it says in verse 1, that the number of the disciples were multiplied. There was a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows, the Grecian widows, were being neglected in the daily administration. They only were taking care of the Hebrews, which was wrong. Well, the twelve, they couldn't do everything. And so in verse 3, they said, Look, wherefore, brethren, look ye out among them seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, who may we appoint over this business. They were looking for those who would be influenced by the Holy Spirit to do what God wanted them to do in every situation. As you are full of the Holy Spirit, the purpose of it, remember, is for service, for you to be influenced by the Holy Spirit for the service of the Lord to carry out the things that God wants you to do. At the same time, we need to learn to yield to the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 7, down in verse 51. He said, you stiff-necked, this is Stephen speaking to about how they were and their fathers were. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do you. You do not want to resist the Holy Spirit when He is working and bringing revelation of truth to you. You want to be receptive to it. You want to be correctable. You want to be ready to take hold of the Word and do the things that He says. You don't just you know, listen to it and then decide whether I want to obey what God's bringing to me or not. That's resisting the Holy Spirit who is wanting them to come to the place of repentance. We also see the Holy Spirit will speak to you and give directions to you. Acts chapter 8, verse 9. This is talking about Philip the Evangelist. And here is where he came upon the one who was sitting in the chariot. This is the, the Ethiopian a eunuch of great authority. And he was sitting, returning, sitting in his chariot, reading Isaiah the prophet. And the Spirit said to Philip, Go near and join thyself to the chariot. The Holy Spirit spoke to him. He can speak to you with a still small voice, or almost like a word that seems like it comes from behind you out of nowhere. It's not necessarily it has to be a, quote, a voice. It'll be coming to you in the Spirit. It's different. Don't think you have to be listening for voices. He can speak with an audible voice. By and large, it's a still, small voice or like a word that seems to come out of nowhere that just comes to you and all of a sudden this, this thought has come into you. The Spirit said to Philip, Go near and join thyself to the chariot. So he will speak directly to you. That means that you can be, you know, have the Holy Spirit speaking things. So don't be surprised if the Holy Spirit speaks something to you. Be ready to respond to it. Here's another case. This is where the this is where they're on the way to Cornelius' house and are coming to, he's relating what happened here, the, about the three men already coming to the house where I was, sent from Caesarea unto me. The Spirit bade me go, Phil, uh, uh, Peter speaking to this of what happened, the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. The Holy Spirit said, go with these guys, even though these guys were Gentiles, remember, and the gospel hadn't come to them yet. So, from their understanding. So, the Spirit told them to go. We've got to be listening to what the Holy Spirit will bring forth. 
Sometimes it'll just be an impression. Sometimes it'll just be a thought. Sometimes it'll be a still small voice. Sometimes it just seems like it comes out of nowhere and all of a sudden it's there. All kinds of ways. Sometimes you might even hear something pretty strong. I'll never forget one time when it was a pastor that came when we were in Ohio and he came and he was very discouraged. And I remember he said he wanted prayer. And so I went up and I laid hands on him. And when I laid hands on him, I'll never forget. I heard loudly, sometimes you hear loudly, I have called you. I heard that as clear as I'm standing here today. It was, you know, sometimes those things happen. Of course, I began to speak forth those things that God gave me to be an encouragement to him because he was kind of getting discouraged and maybe thinking about throwing in the towel. But God had called him. God can do those kind of things and speak to you in those ways. We see over in Acts 13. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I've called them. This is where the prophets and teachers were in the church and they were seeking about what they were supposed to do and they were to go forth and to start taking the gospel out to the different places where they were preaching the gospel in their missionary journey. So they fasted and prayed, laid their hands on them, sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, then sailed to Cyprus. Knowing the fact that as you minister to the Lord, praising and worshiping God, what does that do? That's bringing a filling of the Holy Spirit within you. Fasting also, which silences the flesh, shuts down the flesh, gets you in a position to hear in the Spirit, some people just fast without getting ministering to the Lord and getting filled up with the Holy Spirit. Well, that's a mistake because you might you could hear all kinds of things. You might you can hear the devil a lot and when you get fasting. You get into a spiritual state of shutting down the flesh. That's why you want to get filled up with the Spirit when you're fasting, so you're in a position for the influence of the Holy Spirit. If you're going to fast, make sure you're in the Word and/or ministering to the Lord, so you're in the presence of the Lord, so He can speak things to you, so you'll be sure you're hearing the right thing. So the Holy Spirit will speak to you in these ways. But again, the key will be getting filled up with the Holy Spirit. That's also the key to operating in the gifts of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit are put in you, but as you get filled up with the Holy Spirit, especially through praying in tongues, praise and worship, then you'll be in a position for the Holy Spirit to manifest Himself and to bring these things forth in your life. Acts chapter 8, verse 39. The Holy Spirit can do all kinds of things. This is the case where after the Ethiopian eunuch had received the gospel and he got born again and then he was going to be, he was being baptized. They both went down in the water. It says when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip that the eunuch saw him no more and he went on his way rejoicing. He transported him. He caught up and all of a sudden he was there. Now he's not there. He was transported to another place. God can do those kinds of things. I'll never forget the testimony I heard of, of a particular missionary where he was being chased by natives and the natives were violent natives and they were, they were planning on killing him. And he got to a place where it was a, a river and he just prayed and all of a sudden he's on one side of the river and the next minute the Holy Spirit transported him across the river and he's on the other side and he escaped. God delivered him. The Holy Spirit can do powerful things. And he was caught up out of the water. He caught him away. This means to catch you up. It's the same word harpazo that's used when it talks about catching us up to meet the Lord in the air. Catching up and taking us up. He caught him up and took him away. God wants you to understand the Holy Spirit can do all kinds of things. Don't ever limit him or don't ever think that he can't do something in a situation. Acts chapter 9, in verse 17. Here's where Ananias went his way. This is when Saul got converted on the way to Damascus. Entered in the house, put his hands on him, and said, Brother Saul, the Lord even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Remember what filling's for? For service. This is a different aspect of service. There can be a filling of the service generally by praise and worship and praying in tongues and prayer. This was a filling of the Holy Spirit where he, the ministry gift came upon him for the ministry that he was called to. 
And so he laid, came here and prayed for him that he might receive his sight, put his hands on him, and also this filling of the Holy Spirit for the ministry gift that he had to carry out the ministry of the Lord. Because what happened after that, he went and began to preach Christ in the synagogues right off the bat because of the ministry gift that was put upon him. And he was sent forth to minister not only to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles and to the kings, as you read in the book of Acts. Another thing that we see is the Holy Spirit will bring forth edification and exhortation as prophecy brings, but also encouragement and comfort. In Acts chapter 9, verse 31, then had the churches rest throughout all Judea. There was tremendous persecution prior to that. And Galilee and Samaria were edified, walking in the fear of the Lord. And the comfort, this word also means for encouragement, the encouragement and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will encourage you. Do not let yourself get discouraged. Get yourself in the Word. Get yourself praying. Get yourself uh, praising and worshiping God, praying in tongues, and the Holy Spirit will work to encourage you and comfort you and minister to you. But really, this especially means often, in this case, the encouragement of the Holy Spirit. God will encourage you and comfort you, exhort you, all these kinds of things. He is the comforter who does all these things. Another thing is he will give you visions. Here's the thing where a time when Peter had a vision in Acts chapter 10 and in verse 19, when you have a vision, don't try to figure it out yourself. You thank the Holy Spirit for bringing a revelation of it. Peter had this vision. While Peter thought on the vision, it's okay to think on the vision, but you don't want to try to figure it out yourself. The Holy Spirit then spoke to him and said, Three men seek thee. Rise therefore, get thee down, go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. The vision prepared him about the fact that he was going to be going and ministering to those which he thought were unclean, but now they're not unclean. He said they're not unclean, talking about the Gentiles and how the gospel was going to come to Cornelius' house. So as you think on it, then the Holy Spirit will speak to you. And the Holy Spirit will bring revelation to you. You know, we need to get God inside minded and learn to listen to the Holy Spirit and look for Him. Not like we're looking for voices or trying these things, but we're being aware and ready to listen to anything that He might bring. And He will bring things to you. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. The anointing of the Holy Spirit and with power is what was upon him as he went to do the works of God. That anointing will be upon you. That's another subject which we will be talking about in a future session. How the anointing works. What's necessary for you to see the anointing manifest in you. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with them. The anointing of the Holy Spirit and power will enable you to go and to do the mighty works of the Lord, of course, with the authority that He's given unto you as you act upon the Word of God. Another thing, the Holy Spirit, again, will lead, guide, bring revelation of things, all kinds of things that He'll do. This is a case in Acts 11, verse 28, when Agabus, who was a prophet, he stood up, one of them, Agabus, signified by the Spirit that there should be a great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. He can make known, is what this really means, signified or made known that there would be this great famine. A dearth was a famine, and it happened. God can show you things that will be coming. Remember, the Holy Spirit shows us things to come. This is why we need to get filled up with the Holy Spirit on a daily basis for the influence of the Holy Spirit. Many Christians are born again, even lots have the Holy Spirit, and yet they don't see the Holy Spirit manifesting Himself because they don't get filled up with the Holy Spirit through prayer, through praise, worship. You need to do things to cause the influence of the Holy Spirit in your life. Just because He's there doesn't mean He's going to do anything. You want to see a filling of the Holy Spirit. This is why praise Prayer is so important. You minister to God, it's also ministering to yourself to bring a continual filling of the Holy Spirit. Same with praying, same with praying in tongues. And we spend some time praying in tongues. It is going to bring a filling of the Holy Spirit for the influence of the Holy Spirit. 
Here we see it again. Paul dealt successfully with this situation where Acts 13, 7, they were in the, there was a deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man. He called for Barnabas and Saul. He desired to hear the word of God. Well, the devil didn't want that. Elimus the sorcerer, so as his name by interpretation withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. This guy involved in witchcraft was trying to stop this guy from hearing the word. So what's he going to do? You can't do it, you can't try to deal with the flesh. You got to deal with it by the power of God, by the Holy Spirit, according to the word, and do what needs to be done. So Saul, who also was called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, Ah, why was he filled with the Holy Spirit? This guy was obviously praying in tongues, praising and worshiping God, staying filled up with the Holy Spirit for the influence of the Holy Spirit. Filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. He said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? He spoke, spoke with boldness, didn't he? And that's what the Holy Spirit will bring a boldness upon you. Courage and boldness to deal with a situation and speak truth. He declares these things. And then the Holy Spirit had him bring a mini judgment upon him. He says, Now, behold, the hand of the Lord's upon thee. Thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. <laughs> that took care of that. The deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. This is the teaching of the Lord. Otherwise, God wants you to get filled up with the Holy Spirit to deal with whatever situation comes. And you might even have a case where you, a blindness is going to put on someone in a temporary situation in order to stop their works from trying to hinder the things of God. God wants us to be ready. Same kind of situation over in Acts chapter 16. Here they go, they're preaching the gospel, and the, Paul's going forth in the cities. Churches are getting established. And they're looking for the ways to go. In fact, we'll look at this for a moment. Verse 6, the Holy Spirit also will tell you when you shouldn't be doing something or show you in some way that he doesn't want you to do something. Now when they were gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost, just preach the word in Asia. Later they did, but it wasn't the time to do it. So the Holy Spirit will say, no, otherwise you don't want to be, get ahead of the Holy Spirit or do it your way, it won't work. You want to be in the timing and the flow of the Holy Spirit. They were come to Mysia, they essayed, or were trying to, uh, attempting, trying to go into Bithynia, but the su Spirit suffered them not, said, nope, you're not to go there either. After passing by Mysia, they come down to Troas. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. Now God, God can speak lots of different ways. So he gets a vision all of a sudden. And there stood a man of Macedonia, prayed him, saying, Come over unto Macedonia and help us. So the Holy Spirit gives him a vision. And obviously, what's this telling you? He's supposed to go to Macedonia to preach the gospel. After he'd seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go to Macedonia, assuring, thirdly, gathering that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel unto them. So they're on their way over to there, and they come to Philippi. This is in Macedonia. This is how they got to Philippi which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia in a colony. And we were in that city abiding in certain days. And so now they're, they're, they come in contact with this Lydia and worship God. And the Lord uh, opened the, her heart. The Lord opened. She attended the things that Paul ministered to her. She ended up getting baptized. So she, she was now, um, you know, walk, someone he was in fellowship with. At the same time, the devil didn't like the fact that he showed up in Philippi to preach the gospel and the devil showed up. Well, again, remember, he was continually being filled with the Holy Spirit to deal with situations. Came to pass, he went to prayer. A certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. Uh, would they like him to come into town? No, not, they didn't want Paul around. The same followed Paul and us, cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us not the way of salvation. It means a way of salvation. There's no definite article in the Greek. Young's corrects it, a way of salvation, which is saying, he shows us a way of salvation, but I've been showing you a way of salvation because remember, there's many ways to God as we hear going forth today, lies. No, there's only one way. 
Well, he wasn't going to put up with that for a while. She did this many days. He put up for a while. Paul, being grieved, and who would have caused him to be grieved? The Holy Spirit turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And it wasn't just out immediately. It came out the same hour because he had to continually command. The word command is present tense. He continually battled and commanded that spirit to come out of her, to stop her from operating that soothsaying, lying, deceiving, saying there's many ways to be saved and all the lies that she was deceiving the people with. Eliminated that. Stopped that work. Because he was continually being filled with the Spirit. Here he was grieved, and it certainly would have been by the Holy Spirit's work. God wants us to be ready to do the things that he wants. The Holy Spirit has come to dwell in you, not just to give you revelation. And he does take the word and writes it in your heart and mind, does many things. But he's going to lead you and guide you on a daily basis if you get filled up with the Holy Spirit to do the things that are necessary. In Acts chapter 13, we pick up here. Here's they were speaking boldly, and they were declaring um, the gospel to them. And they, here they came to the Gentiles. They were glad, glorified the word of the Lord. They were hearing the gospel and coming to be born again. The word of the Lord was published through all, throughout all the region. Uh, what did the devil think about that? He didn't like that a bit, so what's he going to do? He's going to stir up the Jews that were against it, the religious people. The Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women. Chief men of the city raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas, expelled them out of their coasts. People that aren't on the right page, you know, and aren't in line with the truth, will try to be used to the devil, use them to stir up negative things. Now, if you get people stop you, are you going to get all upset, down, depressed, negative? No. They shook the dust off their feet against them, came to Iconium. Disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. They didn't let anything faze them. You should be filled with the joy and the Holy Ghost because you're serving the Lord. Don't get reacting because of what people do or don't do or they respond to the gospel or they don't or they get upset or they persecute you or whatever it might happen. Keep your eyes on the Lord, shake the dust off and move on to the next person. And don't let yourself back off from doing the things of the Word. God wants you to continually get filled up with the Holy Spirit. He's going to be leading you and guiding you as you're ministering to people. God wants us to do these things and to see people be set free. Praise God. We've got to be used to the Lord. Don't let your joy be taken away. And don't let yourself stop being from filled up with the Holy Spirit. Wherever he was going, the Holy Spirit was working. Acts chapter 18. We pick up over here in verse 5. And Silas and Timotheus were come to Macedonia. Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. He was get, getting continually pressed by them. They opposed themselves and blasphemed him, shook his raiment, said unto him, Your blood be upon your own heads. I'm clean. Henceforth I'll go unto the Gentiles. They kept on coming against him, and he just shook it off, says, I'm going to the Gentiles. He didn't let it phase him. You can't let anything phase you. You've got to just go forth and keep preaching the gospel. So he departed thence, entered a certain man's house, found a guy that's worshiping God, had fellowship with him, obviously. This guy got believed, his, all of his house believed, and they got baptized. Great. They spake, then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace. The Holy Spirit will not have you cower away in fear. He will not have you back off. He wants you to be not afraid. He wants you to be bold. He wants you to speak. And so he spoke to him again. He encouraged him again. Look at the Holy Spirit's encouraging him in the things of God. He spoke to him in a vision. I am with thee. No man shall set thee on hurt on thee, for I have much people in this city. So otherwise, God was encouraging him, the fact that he was going to be protected. And what ended up happened, because he was encouraged by the Lord of what he wanted to do, he ends up staying there a year and a six months, teaching the word of God to them. See, God kind of set him up for, okay, this is what I want you to do. Don't get discouraged about this. And so he, he follows the, the Holy Spirit, and certainly encouragement. And now he's there ministering to these people for a year and a half, getting the word of God sown in them. God wants us to do the things that he wants us to do and to go and preach the gospel. He was led by the Holy Spirit in everything that he was doing. We come down over to chapter 19. 
verse 21. After these things were ended, Paul purposed in the Spirit. You purpose things in the Spirit according to what God wants you to do as you're following the leading of the Holy Spirit. You're following what, the line with the Word, of course, when he passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying, after I've been there, I must also see Rome. God has shown him the things that he wanted him to do, and, and he decided he, of course, was going to go and do all these things. This is what God wants. He wants you to understand that you are to be led by the Holy Spirit. He will lead you. He will guide you. He will show you things to come. He will bring thoughts to you. He'll bring revelation to you. He'll teach you, show you coming things. He will, you know, all kinds of situations will come up, but God will always be there to lead you, deal with situations, cast out the devil out of somebody, miss the darkness upon him, stop the works of the enemy. One thing for sure, you will always have a boldness, you will have a confidence, you will have the leading of the Lord, you will have the encouragement of him, the comfort of him, God giving, giving directions to you. And if you're not supposed to go somewhere, he'll say, don't go there. And he'll get it over to you when you are to do something. You do not want to follow anything without the peace of the Lord. If you don't have the peace of the Lord, don't make a mistake. You could make mistakes and go in some direction and you miss the whole boat. Mm -hmm. Now we got to make sure we're going the right way. So the Holy Spirit will lead you, he will guide you, and show you the way to go. One last scripture before we close for this morning. Over in Romans chapter 8. Quite a statement. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. That tells you something. How about the guys that aren't led by the Spirit of God? Are they the sons of God? Well, they may be in the fact that they're born again, but they're really not the sons of God because if you're a real son of God, you're to be following the Spirit from your Father, which is the Holy Spirit, who's going to lead you and guide you because the Father is going to direct you in everything you do by the Holy Spirit. We are to be led by the Spirit of God. Know that God will lead you. He will guide you. He'll lead you and guide you into all the truth, remember? He'll lead you and guide you every step of the way. You need to trust in Him. You need to, one thing though is important. You're going to get your eyes in, in on, the, in, you're going to be in the Word of God. You're going to be doing the things that are necessary to cause you to be filled up with the Holy Spirit. This is why you need to be a praiser and a worshiper of God. You need to be praying and you need to be praying in tongues. If you don't have your prayer language, it's hindering you greatly from being filled up with the Holy Spirit. You need to get your prayer language. Everybody needs to pray in tongues. That's why the devil has fought against it so much. So God wants every single one of you to have your prayer language, but don't also don't be one of those who has it and never uses it. He wants you to pray in tongues. Do it on a daily basis. It will cause a filling of the Holy Spirit for the influence of the Holy Spirit in your life. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the revelation from the Word of God of the work of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. I thank you that I have been born again, being baptized with the Holy Spirit. I received the Holy Spirit when He came to dwell in me. I will be continually filled with the Holy Spirit through praise and worship and prayer and praying in tongues. I thank you. The Holy Spirit will lead me. He will speak to me. He will give me revelation. He's come to abide in me, and I am to know Him. He will teach me all things. He will bring all things to my remembrance. He will always testify of things of Jesus and glorify Him. He does not originate things. Anything contrary to the Word is not from the Holy Spirit. I thank you for the Holy Spirit leading me and guiding me into all truth and showing me things that are coming. I thank you for using me in ministering to others through prophecy. Thank you for visions and dreams you might give me. I thank you. I will do what the Word says by praying and praising and worshiping so I am continually filled with the Holy Spirit for the influence of the Holy Spirit to lead me and guide me, to bring great boldness, to deal with any situation, the power of God in operation in every situation 
I might come in contact with. I thank you that as I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will continually comfort me, encourage me, exhort me, direct me in the things that I am to do. And I thank you that I will be led by the Holy Spirit in all things. And regardless of what happens, I will continually maintain joy, be filled with the Holy Spirit, serving the Lord, doing what God wants me to do. I will not get discouraged. I will not get in the flesh. I will maintain being filled with the Holy Spirit so I can deal with everything that would come against me in any situation. I thank you for the Holy Spirit who will continually be working in my life, influencing me to see the will of God come to pass in every situation. Thank you for the working of the Holy Spirit in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. This is part one. Tonight will be the second part of talking about the Holy Spirit. We've got lots of scriptures to cover more about the subject of the working of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament and how He wants to work in your life. Father, we thank You for bringing revelation to each one and that each one will understand the importance of getting filled up with the Holy Spirit for the leading and the guiding of the Holy Spirit, for the influence of it, to see the Lord accomplish what He purposes. And as this last scripture that we read, we will be led by the Spirit of God, so we will truly be the sons of God, being led by our Heavenly Father. Father, thank you for much fruit as we hear and do this word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.